Good evening and welcome to this webinar on ISTAR's patented Mandalay scan pattern, new technology for improved results with web source OCT. It's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Jörg Wagner. Jörg Wagner is a core developer of the Mandalay scan pattern, which is unique for the ISTAR precision OCT. He's going to give you more insights on this unique and patented scan pattern and its OCT inherent motion compensation. Jörg Wagner holds a Master of Science as well as a PhD in Biomedical Engineering, and he has been with Hawkstride for more than three years, fully involved in the development of the ISTAR. He now moved on to aerodynamics for bikes, as you can see on his background, and I would like to welcome him here this evening. During the session, you can uh, use the Q&A section of Zoom to leave your questions, which we're going to address at the end of the session. So thank you very much for joining us for this unique event. And Jörg, it's your voice now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, nice seeing you again. And uh, hi, everyone. I'm happy to present the so-called uh, Mendeley scan pattern and how it improves the results with uh, swap source OCT. Um, I will show how the combination of the Mendeley scan pattern and the motion compensation contributes to uh, improved results. And uh, this webinar will have its focus on the OCT-based measurements. Uh, as told, I was part of the interdisciplinary team that developed the ISTAR over the last years. And I was responsible for a big portion of the algorithms uh, that enable the three-dimensional measurement of the eye by OCT. Uh, however, I was only one of over 20 people uh, that were involved in the development of the ISTAR. Um, I will start with, uh, with a vlog about the pipeline consisting of uh, scanning, segmentation and the motion compensation. You will see that the Mendeley scan pattern plays a crucial role for the capabilities of the ISTAR. Uh, then I will elaborate on the interpretation of so-called virtual e-scans. In the end, there will be some time for questions. So to give an overview, um, our OCT pipeline consists of three steps. The two-dimensional scanning of the eye, the segmentation of the cornea in the resulting scan, and the motion compensation. Based on this pipeline, we determine all the OCT-based measurements. This includes the biometry, the simulated keratometry, the topography, and imaging in the four B scans. Therefore, the scanning and also the motion compensation are essential for the quality of the measurements. Um, one main challenge when measuring the eye with OCT is the handling of eye motion. Um, even when the head is on a rest and the patient is fixating on the target, there will always be some motion. In this motion, the translative parts along X, Y, and Z are dominant. Uh, and this motion has a negative influence on the measurement and has to be addressed. Um, based uh, on literature and our own investigations, we expect continuous corneal displacements of around 100 micrometers uh, with up to three hertz, and also fast sporadic saccades with amplitudes up to 170 micrometers. Uh, the Mendeley scan pattern is only one of our technical solutions uh, for solving the problem of motion during measurements. The following three technical solutions minimize the negative impact of eye motion on the eye star measurement. First, this is the uh, special swept source OCT system, then the Mandalay scan pattern, 
and our uh, model-based motion compensation. Uh, this web source OCT system enables to acquire A scans that cover the whole depth of the eye. This solution makes the individual A scans robust to motion. The so-called Mandalay scan pattern features a dense sampling of the eye and enables accurate motion compensation. The model-based motion compensation enables the uh, compensation of eye motion in three dimensions. All these solutions combined lead to improved outcomes and enables to fulfill the type A topography standard. So uh, now let's have a look at the difference between the commonly used uh, radial scanning and our Mandalay scan pattern. So the classical radial scan pattern commonly used by other devices um, consists of a sequence of rotated B scans over the vertex, as you can see here. Uh, the B scans have a common intersection point over the vertex, which allows for easy motion correction in axial direction. However, this uh, motion correction is usually limited to the axial direction and individual B scans are usually assumed to be motionless. So our approach goes further. Um, our Mandalay scan pattern consists of a sequence of loops over the vertex. This leads to a dense scan of the eye, which refines over time, as shown here. It also leads to a high number of overlaps or intersections, both in the center and in the periphery. We repeat this scan pattern four times, which results in a scan of 64,000 A scans with a total duration of two seconds. So uh, summarized, our scan pattern has a duration of half a second, consists of six, uh, 16,000 scan points and scans 32 times over the vertex. We repeat this scan pattern four times, which leads to a measurement with a duration of two seconds and consisting of 64 A scans. In total, we scan the vertex 180 times, uh, 28 times. So uh, one loop of the scan pattern goes from the vertex to periphery and back. This leads to a scan in which the cornea has a cosine shaped oscillation as shown here in the lower picture. In this scan, our part of scan, the cornea is at the top and the lens is at the bottom. The lens is interrupted by the scan over the iris. Oh, this part here. As already shown, our scan consists of a long sequence of such loops, 128 in total. As you can see, just seven of these loops already lead to a large number of intersections. So here in the center and in the periphery. The resulting Mandalay scan has the following positive properties. It features a high uh, scanning density, which has a positive effect uh, for topography, symmetry, and imaging. It has an increased density in the center, which has a positive effect on biometry. In addition, its trajectory has a high number of intersections, which allow for high resolution motion compensation in three dimensions. This motion compensation has a positive effect on all OCT-based measurements. 
Um, the scanning of the eye is followed by the segmentation of the scans. This determines the axial position of the cornea in the scan. In the upper image here, we see uh, the original scan, or better, uh, part of it. And in the lower image, you can see the same scan with the front of the cornea identified. Together with the known scan coordinates, this allows the creation of a three-dimensional point cloud, as illustrated here. But due to eye movement, the points of the cloud are not on one surface. Here illustrated is a point cloud from an eye with movement in Z direction. Therefore, in the next step, we identify and correct this movement. Uh, the high number of intersections in the scan pattern enables a stable and high resolution determination of the movement. Uh, for this purpose, we model the measured point cloud with the model consisting of a surface and three dimensional motion. So, uh, put simply, we try to explain the measured point cloud with the surface and three-dimensional motion. As a model for the surface, we use Zernike polynomials, which are often used for the description of optical surfaces. For the motion each, uh, in each dimension, uh, we model with the continuous piecewise polynomial function. Um, this modeling is done in a joint optimi optimization step and allows us to reconstruct a motionless measurement, as indicated here on the right. Uh, in the next two slides, I will show an interesting positive side effect of the movement when compensated. This a uh, slide here illustrates the scanning of a laterally moving eye. At this point, we only know the scan coordinates in the device coordinate system. However, the scan coordinates on the eye are not known because the eye has moved during the measurement. So the moving of the eye is illustrated by this blurred image of it. After motion correction, we know the scan coordinates in the eye coordinate system. As you can see, lateral movement leads to further refinement of the eye in the eye coordinate system. This is because each scan repetition measures slightly different positions on the eye. So to compare, this is what we know before the motion compensation. And this is uh, how our scan looks like in the eye coordinate system. So as a result, we get the very dense volume of the eye. This volume allows us to generate so-called virtual E scans. For this, we collect and average the A scans along the meridians. So here for different meridians. Uh, because we have this dense uh, point cloud, we can also generate the B scan along the lens tilt plane without knowing its orientation before the measurement. But in principle, we can also generate B scans along any trajectory. So here we see the influence of the motion compensation on the virtual B scans. Above, we see how the movement leads to a blurred B scans with step artifacts. Here you see the step artifacts um, on the cornea. This is because we average several A scans that were not taken at the same, same time to generate a virtual B, uh, A scan and B scan. Below, we see the B scans uh, with, with successfully motion correction. 
resulting in a sharp image of the cornea, lens, and the retina. So let me briefly summarize the technical features of the ISTAR that were presented in the first part of the webinar. First, we use a swept source OCT system that allows for motion insensitive eye scans over the entire depth of the eye. We use a Mandalay scan pattern, which has a high sampling density. This scan pattern allows us to perform high resolution motion correction in three dimensions. The resulting motion-free measurement enables accurate OCT-based biometry, simkeratometry, and topography. But it also allows us to uh, calculate virtual B scans. So now let's continue with the second part of the webinar the interpretation of the virtual B scans. Um, we will look at some special characteristics of these virtual B scans caused by the way that virtual B scans are generated. Um, the main point to keep in mind is that virtual A scans are generated from A scans that are next to each other in space, but not in time. So therefore, changes during the measurement can lead to special features in the B scans. Um, we will look at four virtual B scans and discuss their appearance. So here's the first example. Um, here you can see a virtual B scans with a sharp cornea, lens, and retina. We also see a clear coverage due to the upper eyelid in this region here. This indicates a clean measurement with consistent eye opening. Now let's look at the second example. First of all, we observed that the natural lens was replaced by an IOL. Further, we can see a sharp cornea, iris, and retina. However, we can also see some semi-transparent coverage due to the upper eyelid. The coverage due to the lower eyelid is quite similar, showing some kind of shadow effect. So um, here you see a part where the coverage seems to be kind of semi-transparent. And here you see some shadow effect. So uh, what are the explanations for these features? These features can be explained by a change in the eye opening during the measurement. Therefore, parts of the cornea were measured with and without eyelid coverage. These are these parts that I marked. So here's the third example. Again, we observe a sharp cornea, iris, and retina. And again, we see some kind of transparent coverage due to the upper eyelid. Here. And also um, when looking at the iris. The explanation is that the eyelid was only uh, present during part of the measurement. Therefore, the upper part was once measured with coverage and once without. Um, now let's look at the last example, which shows a very rare case. Again, we see a sharp cornea, 
However, this time we observe an inconsistent iris and IOL. So the explanation is that we are with that the viewing direction of the patient changed during measurement. Because the cornea was, uh, has almost a spherical shape, this effect is not visible on the cornea. Because the motion compensation in, in X, Y, and Z worked, the cornea is sharp and clear. I have to point out that this, that this uh, kind of D-scans is very rare and usually is detected uh, by our algorithms. However, when the, when the cornea is, is very uh, spherical shaped, so, um, yeah, it, it's, sometimes it's not detected. So it's crucial to look at the B-scans of the measurements. So uh, I was quite fast, but I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Jörg, for this very interesting talk on the Mandalay scan pattern and the motion inherent, uh, uh, the OCT inherent motion compensation. Sorry for that. Um, <clears throat> we do have um, one question. Um, when you talked about the um, B scans provided, you showed always radial B scans. Is it also possible to have different patterns like a line scan and so forth? Um, in theory, yes. Uh, you can generate any uh, B scan along any trajectory that you want. However, uh, it's not yet implemented and I don't know uh, when it will be implemented. Mm -hmm. But basically, every kind of imaginable scan could be provided from the Mandalay scan pattern and its motion compensation. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> Another question. Um, in the B scans provided, we always see the retina. Is the image which is this visible there the fovea or is it the fovea visible in general? Um. I mean, oh, uh, although it looks like uh, like a scan, in reality, it's it's just a point on on the on the retina. So we are not if if the eye doesn't have any refraction, we, we don't really scan uh, the retina. It only seems like we are scanning the retina because we have to do some assumption, uh, assumptions concerning the refractive power of the cornea to, to generate the B-scan. So uh, I can't say which exact point will be um, scanned. So it's basically a point measurement on the point of fixation in the eye. Okay, thank you very exactly. much for this. And yeah. um, the last question I got for the moment is, uh, what's the quality of the topography based on the OCT scan? Uh, say again, please. What's the quality of the topography based on the OCT scan? The quality of the topography, of the topography yes. Based on? On the OCT. Um, I mean, um, where do I have it? So uh, we fulfill uh, type A topography. And uh, however, this is, is a technical uh, assessment of the capabilities. But we uh, conducted a clinical study to uh, access the, the, the clinical performance. And we are comparable with uh, standard topographers that are on the market. Good. I quickly check the Q&A section again. There are no more questions from the audience. If there are questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A section. We may wait a few more seconds if there are some more questions available.
I'll also quickly check the chat. There's no more questions. So thank you very much, Jörg, for this very interesting talk. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, oh, there, there's a question that just came in the chat. Is it possible to observe the anterior vitreous and its interface with the lens? Um, do I have a picture? So you mean um, that you, uh, you, I mean, you can clearly see the, the back of the lens. And um, as a consequence, you also see the, the, the whole part between, between the back of the lens and the retina. So we don't have to stitch some A scans together. So we have the full depth. Um, yeah, but, but usually do, you don't see that much. Maybe you have floaters, you will see them. Um, yeah. So you don't have uh, blind spots in, in the in the B scans. Maybe I can add a few lines here. As already mentioned by Jörg, there's no stitching involved with the technology we are using. So they are always full A scans, which we are using to create B scans from. And therefore we can always see everything from the cornea to the iris in one single scan. And it's also possible to see what's behind the lens. So the anterior vitreous is there for observation. But because of the shadowing effect of the iris, it's always limited to the visible part, basically. And the whole thing goes down like a funnel because of refraction. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Excellent. Exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah. OK, let's quickly check if there are more questions. doesn't look like. So again, thank you very much. And please keep in mind the all the webinars of this webinar series of the Biometry Focus Month are online to view also after the meeting itself. It's on our webpage and you can always go there and have a look. We're also having more webinars on. Uh, next week, we start with a webinar on, <coughs> on Cernic polynomials and please join it. There's one question that just came in. From what can be seen in that scan, I'm impressed that it is possible. Okay, so that was the answer of the um, author of the first question. Okay, so thank you very much. And I wish everybody a good evening or late night if, we, if you are in the East or Good day if you're in the West from Europe. Thank you very much and have a good evening. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining.